everybody. It's the inaugural episode of the Cutting Edge Podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here. To my right is uh, the esteemed Mr. Rick Weimer. Uh, next to him, Kelly Payette. Next to Kelly, uh, Ms. Nicole Kreitz. And uh, my co-host for the show, Tyler Tallman. Really appreciate you all being here today. Um, the topic of the day is the implications of the No Surprises Act. So this is uh, for our healthcare community that we're, we're speaking to today. This is something a lot of people have probably heard about, maybe read a little bit about, but just from what the media has shared with them. And I'd love to get a little bit deeper into what the implications could be for the healthcare community, especially those of us that work in surgery. Uh, so, you know, we'll, we'll kick it off right away. I'm, you know, one of the first questions that I had to start the conversation is, you know, share your thoughts on the No Surprises Act. You know, what you know, um, what you may not know, maybe something that concerns you about it. And uh, Rick, let's just go ahead and, and start with you. Um, this has uh, been coming up on and off, I think, both at the state and national level for several years now. And I don't know if it's had some fits and starts. Uh, we're certainly aware of it. Uh, we understand why there is a large interest in it because I think patients have a right to know uh, what their health care is going to cost. I think fortunately for us, we've already put some things in place where within our practice, when we do use somebody that's not contract with the insurance company on the front end, we just do full disclosure. And I think where this act is going is I think they want everybody to have transparency and full disclosure. So I'm not sure if legislation is the right approach, but I get the reason why it's become important in the industry. So sure. I was going to say, Rick, when you say full disclosure, tell me a little bit about what that means in the healthcare space. What, what are the types of things that you're having to disclose as a part of this act now? Um, when we do surgery, um, the insurance companies have not been willing to credential or contract at a favorable rate. I shouldn't say favorable and acceptable rate with our surgical assists. So what we do is we tell the patient that our surgical assists are a very important part of our, uh, the procedure for you for safety, outcomes, patient satisfaction, and we will be using them. And we just, we're just very upfront and say they're non-contracted and you will be paying for your services with out of network benefits. And then for full disclosure, we actually have them sign a document so that they understand what they're getting into that makes sense yeah so you know i think it's also important just to note that you know i think all of us sitting at the table would agree that you know being able to have full disclosure with your patients it's an important part of being a quality provider of healthcare. i think a lot of people are very uncertain it's so complex um, that it, it's hard for patients to grasp sometimes what to expect and you know kelly you, you come from a practice management background as well um, and now more into an operational role, helping providers look at their process. You know, share your thoughts on how this, this could impact the burden um, with practices. Yeah, so basically what this is doing is it's causing us to all coordinate, right? Now, not only with the physician practice and the hospital, but now with anesthesia and our assist groups, all separate entities. And it is taking it further now where we have to not only fully disclose to our patients, hey, this provider may be out of network, but to also tell the patient about the pricing transparencies, which we don't always have, right? I don't know what a hospital is charging. I don't know what a surgical assist is charging or the anesthesia group. That's pretty, you know, that's pretty interesting, right? Because I think the average consumer, and Tyler, you know, you and your wife just had a, an experience where you, where you brought a new family member to the world. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned before we came on the air that, you really didn't know who was going to be involved. You didn't yeah, well, know some she, of these things. She just said that sometimes we have to tell the patients that these physicians or these doctors or these assists may be out of network. Well, mm -hmm. it doesn't seem kind of silly that it would that it, we would be saying they may be. We can't really tell you definitely, but it might be out of network. And that was the exact case with my wife and I. We got a bill in the mail uh, from an in-network hospital uh, from an out-of-network anesthesiologist, and they said you owe just under twenty thousand dollars. And it's not what you want to get on a Monday night when you get home from work by any means. Yeah, no question. So, you know, Nicole, from your, from your standpoint, you know, you've, you've been in an interesting position in that, you know, you're advising pro, uh, providers and, and clinics 
on how to implement best practices. You know, how do you see this potentially impacting um, what providers are going to have to do just to have a chance to get paid? Well, I think it that's actually a complicated answer. Um, the new stipulations rely heavily on the assumption that the current system of obtaining a benefits verification, getting a pre-off for a surgery, getting a price quote for a surgery that might not be set at a contracted rate, all of those things we are assuming are currently in place and currently working the way that they are supposed to work. That's not that's not actually the case. Um, so my concern is the additional steps that we're going to have to follow under the new legislature will just compound the problem. I think that if the foundation is not um, solid, then the house is going to crumble. And right now, the foundation of what we do as far as obtaining a fair quote for benefits um, is not very solid. So, you know, I, I think one of the questions I have for the three of you sitting at this table, do you think we're running a risk of chasing providers out of the healthcare system where we already know we have a shortage because the administrative burden is getting to a point that it's just untenable? And, and you know, whoever would like to take that question, feel free. Yeah, I, um, I, it's sort of a yes and no question. It, it comes up every day now within our practice where you run into a situation where it's so complicated and we as physician practices do not really have the ability to set prices just like any other business does. It's, it's one of those situations where the insurance companies control the situation and a lot of different parties hold other parties hostage to try to get the larger part of the pie. And, and I can say that in our practice, five, eight, ten percent of my cost is just due to the complexity. So to answer your question, whether it's going to drive people out or not, it might drive people out of being accessible to the larger population. And somebody might just say, you know what, I can get rid of all this extra staff. I can get rid of all this complexity and see one third as many patients and just go on either a concierge or a very reasonable um, fee-for-service basis because I know our physicians can live on a very fair reimbursement rate if they didn't have to pay for what we consider all this extra complexity that does not add anything to the quality or outcomes of healthcare. So yeah. CJ, is it is it safe to say, I guess what I'm hearing in all this is that the Surprise Act, maybe it has some good things in it, maybe it has some not so good things in it, but it's the implementation of this, Nicole, that you even mentioned that maybe is missing where, yeah, you're, you're supposed to know, it's like getting a quote on something you want done at your house. However, you're not really getting that, but that's really what they intended to do. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, I, I definitely would say that. I mean, you know, uh, one of the things that I would add here, I think legislation, because we've, we've been very forward thinking and active with legislators at this point um, in terms of speaking to the members of the Texas delegation. And what we're hearing is this is all about the unintended consequences. We as a community have to uncover what the unintended consequences of this legislation is, because none of us... Uh, disagree with, with the fact that there should be transparency and there should should be a much easier pathway for patients to understand what's going to cost them. Absolutely. But, you know, I, I'm curious, um, you know, from the panel here uh, to be able to talk about what is the most concerning unintended, unintended consequence that this could have uh, on, on the healthcare. It's quality uh, of care. It's quality of care. So to, to kind of, you know, Put it in perspective for somebody who may not know healthcare very well. Your kid just broke their leg, okay? Yep. And it's four o'clock, you know a surgeon's office is open. You're going to see that surgeon, the surgeon that you know and that you love, right? But it's, it's four o'clock, by the time you get checked in, everything, you're seeing a surgeon at five o'clock with a broken leg. The doctor is going to have to take that child to surgery a lot of times, right? Right then and there. Well, the doctor either doesn't have a PA, right? Because the practice can't afford it, or the surgical assist that we're going to have to because we have what you call on call because doctors are not supernatural they have to sleep they have to eat yeah. um, and so the physician that happens to be in the clinic is going to treat the patient they're going to take it to an in-network hospital but at this 
point in time, the assist that may be coming to help the provider will not be in network. And that is the insurance payer's own doing by not contracting with the surgical assists or not contracting fairly to even pay. Because see, this gets real complicated with even paying enough to pay the salaries of these individuals. So this is such a larger topic in the fact that you're wanting to pay $20 for a three hour surgery when the salary of that individual you know, is a six figure salary, let's say. And so at the end of the day, if the provider can't use that surgical assist, it's, it's quality of care. He's not gonna have the help that he needs. Well, doesn't, doesn't that come downhill to, to dealing with patient safety? I mean, it sounds mm-hmm. to me like if, if yeah. the provider can't get paid enough, at least if it's me, I'm just going to go find, I'll go sell hot dogs on the corner, right? Like, let's let's be honest. I mean, speak to that. Well, you know, to, to add on what Kelly says, where, where our challenge is that often non-medical providers or non-medical personnel are trying to decide on behalf of the doctor who they can and who they cannot use to help them with their case. And... Yeah, sure, maybe a hand surgeon doesn't, they can say, well, you know, what are you gonna do, hold their finger? You don't really need two people, but there's a lot of things involved with safety and quality and outcomes and room turnover and two sets of eyes that really ensure a much better quality and safe outcome for the patient. And I think, you know, they don't contract with you because they don't think you need it, but shouldn't the physician do it. And I can tell you, and, and, and there's a lot of talk out there about physicians just doing it for the money, but I know that the vast, vast majority of physicians will only do what's appropriate for the patient, and they're not sitting at the cash register when they're doing it. So to, they, they need to be able to say, this is what I need to do, how I need to do it, and where I need to do it, and they need to be fairly compensated so, for that. So Rick, if I heard that correctly, in a nutshell, <laughs> we're allowing the insurance company to decide whether or not a, an assist is appropriate for a physician? Correct. Yes. And, well, wh- and how do they, what's their qualification from a medical standpoint to make that decision? They have nurse, they have nurse case managers. Okay. So basically all of these insurances, and remind you, not even every single insurance can get on the same page. United Healthcare might cover an assist for this surgery, while Cigna will not. So they can't even, they make their own medical guidelines by their own, what I assume, by the way, we've never been able to sit down, but they make their own medical guidelines. They have what you call a pre-authorization, things you have to go through, you have covered and non-covered of an assist. But many people don't understand, other than that orthopedic surgeon who, guess what, may not be an orthopedic surgeon that is the CMO of United Healthcare making the decisions, but the orthopedic surgeon, I've, I've watched surgeries. They have tools that they have to clamp down all while cutting, and it takes an assist to hold, clamp, pull back the whole skin, you know what I mean, while the mm-hmm. surgeon is cutting and doing these other things, yet an assist isn't covered on that, mm-hmm. dictated by the insurance. Okay, so, you know, look, we're, we're talking about, you know, what I don't want to do is, is dog the insurance companies because I think there's mm-hmm. there's multiple stakeholders in this deal. So right. let's peel back the onion for a minute and let's talk about the potential cost implications if this legislation is, is not implemented in an ideal manner and who's going to end up carrying the bucket with any type of uh, uh, negative cost implication. Nicole, I'm curious what you think. Yeah, so I, I want to go back just a little bit though. I don't, um, I'm with you, I don't think that we need to get into a zone where we're attacking the carriers or, you know, putting all the blame and all the onus on the insurance company. But I do think it's important to mention that the new stipulations are largely focused on the out-of-network provider and maintaining, you know, fair and um, accurate cost of care for the provider. It doesn't so much address the inaccuracies on the carrier side, which is, I mean, that's glaring. That's a part of the problem. So I think we all agree that we want to eliminate um, any kind of predatory out-of-network billing to the consumer. Um, But to do that, we have to get the carriers to come to the table and offer fair rates and fair reimbursement for these providers. Now, with that reimbursement, you also can factor in what is it going to cost these offices, what is it going to cost these um, hospitals and one-off providers that are in solo practices to be able to beef beef up their staff and accommodate the different intricacies of the new law. Um, if we don't address that, if we can't come to an agreement there, then I'm afraid what we'll start to see is less 
um, small practices. We won't see very many one or two doctors practicing in a small you know, community practice. What we'll see is more large groups, um, hospital-driven systems. And I think that that would definitely leave our healthcare lacking. You know, it works in some settings, it doesn't in others, and we don't want to get to an all or nothing type environment. Sure. Okay. So we've got about two minutes left here uh, in this segment. If you guys had to, to talk to your colleagues here for a minute who are listening in, uh, fellow administrators across multiple practice types, what would be the number one thing that you would tell them to do uh, related to the, the No Surprises Act? Rick, we'll start with you. Well, um Nobody likes adding any extra burden or extra complexity. Um, I think irrespective of the Surprise Act, I, I do think that in the parts that you can control, mm -hmm. you should be very transparent and provide as much information to your, your patients as you can. Um, I think once you get past the practice, I think there's a lot of unknown, a lot of things that need to be worked on. And I think, you know, some of the Surprise Act is trying to address it, but I don't think it's the ultimate solution. Interesting. So we got time for one more response. Uh, you know, Kelly, if you could talk to your colleagues, what, what would you say to them right now about this legislation that's coming down the pike for implementation January 1st of 2022. Yeah, honestly, kind of exactly what Rick said. We, we just all have to work together. We have to keep cost and quality in mind for the payer, the doctor, and the patient. Cost and quality together. And healthcare goes hand in hand, you know what I mean? And quality obviously has to be first, but we have to work together. So basically everything Rick just said. And I don't think this is going to solve the problem. No, I, I, I think we're in for a very interesting time, right? Whenever try to use paper to fix a very real problem, it could be problematic. So guys, thanks for joining us. This is the end of the first segment um, of the Cutting Edge podcast. Um, we're going to be joined next by uh, a couple of uh, surgeons, a GYN surgeon and an orthopedic surgeon, as well as a longtime medical device rep, because we're going to get a, an inside look of this talk about patient safety and quality of care. So again, can't thank you enough for joining us. You bet. And look forward to speaking about this again sometime soon on a future, uh, a future podcast. Absolutely. Cool. Thank All right. You. Thanks, guys. Awesome. Well, uh, everybody, welcome back uh, for segment two of our inaugural podcast for The Cutting Edge. Uh, we had an awesome discussion first, uh, first segment with uh, a number of uh, medical practice administrators and consultants talking about the administrative burden uh, of the No Surprises Act. So, you know, what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to talk to some clinicians that uh, that this could directly impact uh, with patient care and, and uh, care delivery. So we're being joined by uh, Dr. Jessica Shepard. Uh, Dr. Shepard, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, thank you for having me. And uh, Dr. Kevin Cruz. Dr. Cruz, you there? Yes, sir, thanks for having me on, man. Awesome. So uh, let, let's start out, uh, you know, Dr. Cruz, share a little bit about your uh, your specialty and your background. Uh, so I'm an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I specialize in the shoulder. I do, uh, um, I'm in private practice in Dallas, Texas. I trained in uh, South Carolina. Uh, and then I did a fellowship in Pittsburgh and a fellowship in France to specialize in shoulders. I've been out in practice for six years now. And uh, yeah, I grew up in Indiana, Indiana originally, but uh, made my way down to Texas about as fast as I could. So awesome. So, Dr. Shepard, tell us a little bit about your specialty and your background. Absolutely. I am a fellowship trained minimally invasive gynecologic surgeon. So, I specialize mostly in the surgical aspect uh, of complex gynecology uh, and trained mostly in the Northeast, uh, going through New York and then through Philadelphia and doing a fellowship. Um, in Louisville, and, and similar to you, Dr. Cruz, in France as well, um, in Strasbourg. So taking all of that uh, experience and now you know, having done surgery for over 10 years, uh, that's a big part of my practice, and especially in women's health and women's care. There's a lot that we need to you know, get through as far as health care and benefits and talking today on these important topics. Awesome. Well, you know, we wanted to lead out of the gate you know, the, the topic, the overall topic is the implications of the No Surprises Act. And I know that both of you have been briefed by uh, surgical assistants uh, or groups that you work with 
But what we wanted to talk is we really wanted to get down and dirty into the, the environment inside the operating room and the role that the surgical assistant plays up alongside of you. And, you know, uh, Dr. Shepard, just speak a little bit to our audience about, you know, all the various team members that are involved and, and uh, you know, the roles they play uh, in the operating room. Absolutely. You know, when you think of, you know, actually practicing and operating in the, in the operating room, there are a lot of steps that go towards, you know, what makes it efficient, uh, what makes the best care for the patient, which is ultimate, and then also contributing to the post-operative, you know, impact on that patient and also the hospital system. Uh, there are a lot of different variety or a lot of different things that impact how we actually see these outcomes, how we can make the best outcomes for the patient as well as for the healthcare system. Now, typically, you know, when we think of training as a, as a resident or a fellow, you typically operate with attending surgeons. And if you work in an academic setting, you can find that there will be a lot of residents who are there to help provide some of the help throughout the surgery as they're learning as well. But there are many hospitals, you know, most of them, I would say, in surgery care centers throughout the U.S. that don't have that ability to have residents and fellows work with them. And that's where we really have to find that person who's going to be able to give, you know, really good operative assistance to the surgeon while they're operating. And surgical assists are a very big part of how we are able to be efficient and to be um, really you know, do our best in operating in the surgeons and provide the patient good care. So, you know, Dr. Cruz, you know, let's, let's take a, a, a next, another step into that uh, role with the surgical assistant. So specializing in shoulders, you know, imagine what would your world be like if you didn't have all the appropriate team members, including the surgical assistant to work up alongside you? Yeah. So, I mean, honestly, like, you, you cannot do a shoulder replacement by yourself. Like, like it's physically like, it, I mean, I think maybe you could, like maybe you could, I'm trying to pick from mine. It's really difficult to do it with one person, honestly. And I have two assistants help me. And so like, I, I can't, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you an example, a funny story, right? So I was beginning in practice and, and like Dr. Shepard alluded to, like you don't have residents and fellows running around, but my, one of my co- um, one of my partners actually has a fellowship. Like he runs a foot and ankle fellowship in Dallas. And so he had a fellow rotating with him. And, and I went downstairs and it was at the surgical hospital. And uh, believe it or not, it was actually where Tiger Woods had his back fused, but it was up in Plano, right? And really good surgical hospital where TV is at. And the guy who was supposed to be my first assist, you know, he, uh, he was covering me. And then he's like, oh, well, that's a Medicare patient, man. So I can't go cover that one. And so I go downstairs and, and the, they were like, and I was like, well, who's going to help me? And they had this, um, it was like a 75 year old woman who was a scrub tech who had never seen arthroscopy before. And that was, that was going to be my assistant, like the tech actually. And I was like, guys, we're going to have to cancel the case. And so I actually got the fellow, my, my partner's foot and ankle fellow and actually scrubbing the case with me. But, but for a lot of the surgeries we do, you, you literally can't do them without an assistant and you couldn't do them well without question efficiently, you know, and, and that's part of what, you know, helps the healthcare become smooth and efficient and get great outcomes is having, you know, team members involved in um, a lot of the procedures that I perform. I, I don't think that I could do them without an assistant, you know, unless there's some sort of massive revolution in the technology we have right now. So awesome. it's just, it's not a matter of like having it as a luxury. It's just mm -hmm. it's a necessity. It's interesting. So Tyler, I saw your face as we're sitting here, as Dr. Cruz is saying, the surgical assistant steps out because Medicare won't pay for them. What are you thinking yeah. as a patient? I, it, it just, it, it furthers to me just how broken in a lot of ways our system is. And I think it's just such a hot topic. And, and uh, you know, hearing from Dr. Cruz, just the necessity of having to have that person in the room and the fact that a lot of these places that we're going, it's just not an option. And without him having to cancel that case uh, or, you know, without him even considering canceling that case, uh, you know, that here's a person that needs to be operated on and they don't even have the... Uh, the right staff at a hospital that, by the way, I, they're paying a lot of money to, to get, uh, to get work done. Right. So, yeah. And you know, I think too, CJ, you know, like I wrote a book about this, by the way, like about coming into practice as a young surgeon. Hey, bud, just hold on one second, right? All right. Um, so, and in one of the chapters is about having assistance in the OR. And, and what I talk about is that, um, when you first start practice, you need to find a good surgical assist. And maybe you're not ready to have like a full-on PA like to assist you. 
but you need to find a good assist and that's going to, that's going to help your outcomes massively when you start practice. And I think a lot of guys coming into training, they don't understand the way it works when they get out in real private practice and in females too, I'm sorry, I didn't say this. But, but a lot of, of, of physicians don't understand when they come out uh, in training that, that you need to have someone there to assist you. And it's best if it's someone consistent. You don't just want to be grabbing some random tech from the hospital every time because you, they're going to make mistakes. And if you can get that person early on and, and, and create a relationship, your your efficiency, your speed, your your skill level, it just ramps up so fast. There, there, there's, there's I would definitely say one of the things about working efficiently as a surgeon is, and, and anything, if you think of the, you know, the book by Malcolm Gladwell, Outliers, is in order to be the best at your skill is doing it over and over again. But that requires a team and that requires consistency. And that's what surgical assists provide. And when you don't have that team or you have the stress, you know, there's also an emotional aspect of, of um, surgery when, when you're talking about surgeons is getting that crew together. And if there's a lot of time that's spent arguing about who's going to be in the case and who's not able to get reimbursed, I think that those are things that boil down to the actual stress level of not just the surgeon, but the operating uh, room and all the dynamics, as well as the patient. Many times they are brought into these situations because of whether it's payment, whether they're paying, or who's able to be in their case based on uh, insurance. So there's a lot that's composed in all of this. And I definitely feel that the efficiency and effectiveness of the skill of a surgeon is limited when you don't have a consistent team. Yeah, that, I mean, that, those are some great comments. You know, we, Charlie, you've been a, a, a surgical device rep in the orthopedic space for 20 plus years. Not, not to put an age on you, but thanks. <laughs> you know, you, you've, I'm sure you've seen some, uh, some great outcomes and you've also been on the other side where you, they haven't had the right <clears throat> people. It's not just about the tools, but the people. And maybe tell us about what, what you've experienced. Is there anything that comes to mind? Well, you know, I've I've been in um, doing doing hips and knees for going on 22 years now, and I can tell you from just tourniquet time alone what the difference is is when a surgeon has a surgical assist and when they don't have a surgical assist. And the the frustrating part for me is is that this is a, a money play for the insurance companies, and what they don't realize is by pulling these assists out of the surgeries is it's going to increase OR time, which is going to put more, you know, more financial burden on our, our already stressed system. And it's also going to reduce uh, a patient's, you know, ability to have a perfect outcome. Interesting. You know, it, obviously there's a lot of clinical implications here with this, you know, and, and going back to what we, what our topic is with, you know, trying to remove surprise billing from the, uh, from the environment. You know, I'm curious to hear Dr. Shepard and Dr. Cruz what your current providers have said to you about this legislation. What do they know? What do you guys know about the actual legislation itself and, and what it's intended to do? Well, I think that because I have a very astute surgical assist, uh, I know about these these bills and, and legislation that's passed. But if I were to ask my, my colleague and myself, I'll put myself in there, I definitely know that these are things that we don't discuss uh, in the operating room, in the office. Um, and knowing exactly what's going to impact us as providers and, and what that outcome looks like. Many times we're so blind to that, and those are things that we really should be discussing because it's exactly where we are, why we are where we are now. You know, Dr. Cruz, you're, you're part of a larger orthopedic group here at DFW. You know, have you talked to your colleagues, uh, your fellow surgeons and, and partners about what's going on? I mean, what's, what's the chatter amongst your uh, peer group? I knew that there were things in the bill, uh, but I didn't know about surprise billing, but I didn't know how the surgical assist uh, part was going to be addressed. And then, you know, obviously, you might have a conversation about that tonight. And, um, you know, if, if if some of the things that happen, or, well, I guess um, some of the implications of the bill could really have negative impacts on the, uh, you know, or the ability for a surgical assist to make a living doing this, right? Like, like that's the biggest thing. And then you, then you say you're going to put the burden on the patient now if the payers aren't going to pay and doctors say we need this in order to do, you know, proper surgery. Well, then now you're having to take a patient who has a copay, has a deductible, paying out of pocket several thousand dollars, which just keeps going like this, right? Like the deductible just keep going up and up and up and, and the copays just keep going up as the insurance company's profits just keep on skyrocketing. It's actually amazing. Um, but 
but now they're just going to put more on the patient. They're just going to put more on the patient, and it's going to disincentivize people to get things fixed that, that they want to have fixed, and it's going to make it more and more expensive. Absolutely, it's going to be as simple as that. It's so, fall on the patient. you know, one, one of the questions I have, uh, just for the group in general, you know, at what point? Is the surgical assist going to look up or are they starting to look up already and sticking their hand out either to the hospital or to the surgeon and saying, hey, look, insurance just isn't taking care of me here and I'm, I'm afraid to talk to the patient. You need to subsidize me. Uh, Dr. Shepard or Dr. Cruz, have, have you guys felt that at all or, or heard that? Uh, I haven't heard that much, but when I think about it just systemically, it actually is not a very unfounded conversation and I think when we think of the insurance system, uh, it, quite frankly, um, in the U.S., I'm Canadian, so you know I am at least privy to some different types of healthcare and how that works with a with a system and how it can work really well and how it can differ. So I do think that you know, as physicians, where where does that responsibility lie? I, I do feel that the health um, insurance that is for patients is not really for patients. It's not really for physicians. So who is it really for? Um, that I'm sure you can answer that question. Um, but that, that has not come up, but it comes up in conversation in the sense that, well, if we're not going to be incentivized or, or reimbursed by insurance, then who will? And I think that's, those are the questions that should be asked, but I don't really think we have a very good answer. Outside of a good outcome, for the average Joe patient, for myself, isn't there a practical side of this as well? You know, you you obviously uh, speed and outcome is what you're looking for. You, if somebody goes under anesthesia um, and they don't have the surgical assist that they need, they should have in the room. It slows the surgery down, and doesn't that put the patient at risk at some level? Absolutely. That you know, that's what I was alluding to at the beginning. Patient outcomes is is everything. That really is why we practice medicine. That is why um, we're able to do, that's why we're innovative when you think of surgery and the technology and the procedures that we, uh, over the years, have gotten better with. That comes with being able to be focused on the skill set. And part of that ability to be focused on the skill set requires who your team is. And if you have someone who is there understanding that uh, the end goal and the objective of what you're trying to accomplish for this patient, then that's really when you can work. I mean, you could take the same example and bring it to really any type of like, if you were thinking of an auto, an auto uh, factory, if you keep turning over people, you're not going to get the same outcome that you're looking for as far as production and manufacturing of a certain product. And it, the same thing goes, you know, to medicine, specifically for surgery, is you do want to be efficient. You want to be quick. You want to be skilled. And that is really hard to accomplish when you have so many moving variables. Yeah, I think so. And if you look at, if you look at the data, right, and you try to be an evidence-based position, right? And you look at across all specialties, at least in surgery, the one factor that goes across all specialties that's associated with infections, you know, obviously you need to give antibiotic preoperatively that, that has good data, so we do that as a baseline. But there's literally 10,000 other things that you look at with infections, and it's really, really hard to actually um, find things associated with infections because they're so multifactorial. And if, you, if you're trying to do a level one study, you have to power it with like, thousands of patients it's so hard to do that but the one variable is the time of surgery right like if you take a total knee right and you you have a surgeon that does them in 25 minutes which there are now right like guys that are surgeons that have been out of practice for a long time that have a slick system same system all the time and then you have that you you look at the, the infection rates on a total knee that takes an hour and a half or two hours the infection rates are higher and that's for every single surgery that we do and it makes sense right because one of my mentors told me when i was in coming up that you know, operating rooms are, are clean, they're not sterile, right? There's bacteria in the air everywhere we are. And so when someone's body is opened up to the air for a, a longer period of time and you can shave down minutes or hours off that procedure, it's it's better. Like there's the data, I mean, it's, it's, it's profound how important it is. So, you know, I think when we're talking about just, and also the cost and all the other things, but just from an infection standpoint, you know, if, if a procedure takes twice as long, there's more risk. And the longer someone's under anesthesia, you know, the more risk of having a problem with anesthesia. So there's like 80,000 reasons why you should have your surgery become more efficient. And it's hard to argue against having highly skilled people that are incentivized to assist you in surgery. Okay, so, you know, we've got about a minute left here. Uh, you know, if you could say something to your, to your professional colleagues, your fellow surgeons, about this, 
legislation and what the hurt it could put on not only surgical assistance, but anesthesia and potentially for any of you, if you have to go out of network with a payer, what would be the one thing you would say to them? What would be a call to action to them to, to pick up their head and, and, and do something if they happen to hear this podcast? Yeah, I think that it requires us to be diligent um, and acknowledge the responsibility that we have to know what's going on in the health and care and insurance industry. And if that means that finding something, someone or somebody that can create that, that narrative in a much more succinct way than them reading through the bill, as you were saying earlier, because I guess all, I mean, for me included, I have not read through it at all either. But that's, that's where we have to take action. And I think as, as physicians and surgeons, we really need to take the impetus to create more of these conversations and be more aggressive with them. Well, I think that's that's great feedback. You know, the bill happens to be sitting here in front of me. It's almost 500 pages long. Good luck uh, reading it. I, I've spent many a night falling asleep to it. But uh, look, I, I appreciate the two of you joining us so much. You know, Charlie, thanks for, for joining us as well. We didn't get a chance to really dive into the, the device side of what you see. You know, I, I'll just I'll share one story from a device rep that I heard. And, and Charlie, tell me if you if this rings true, but the device rep cannot enter the sterile field, right? They have to stand outside and be a, an observer and use their words to guide what's going on inside the sterile field. And I've, I've heard stories and I actually spent two years of committee in where I watched the scrub tech try to play a dual role of handling the instruments and passing them back and forth and also trying to hold a retractor. And they kind of look like Bozo the clown trying to balance on a ball. Like it just, it just doesn't go. So I think that's a slippery slope we got to be really careful of, Charlie. You know, you're absolutely right. Try and doing a, a hemiarthroplasty at midnight at any hospital around here. See how many. It's usually the, the surgeon and the scrub tack who's also the retractor holder. Oh, yeah. Well, I think it's just such a slippery slope to, to assume that we can do more with less in healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I think it's incumbent upon every provider type, not just the surgical assistants, not just the anesthesia uh, folks, but I think, you know, the surgeons, uh, Dr. Cruz and, and Dr. Shepard, hopefully this has uh, fired you up a little bit where you're willing to have some conversations with your colleagues and we can, you know, start a grassroots effort to get folks engaged. Because the last thing we want is to see patient care, patient, uh, uh, the, the quality of outcomes suffer. And uh, that's the whole reason we're doing this. So thanks for joining us. This brings us to the end of our second uh, segment, and uh, we look forward to connecting with uh, both of you in the future. All right. Thank you, CJ. Thanks. Thanks, man. Right, See you guys. Have a good night. All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. bye. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us for our third and final uh, segment of our inaugural podcast for the Cutting Edge. Uh, topic, once again, is the implications of the No Surprises Act. So, and we've talked to uh, practice administrators, medical practice administrators, then we've talked with surgeons and a surgical device rep who are in the active OR and depend on our surgical assistance. But now we're gonna talk to two uh, wily veterans uh, of the <laughs> OR here. Uh, many years of experience, we won't say how many, but uh, also very well trained on the Da Vinci platform mm -hmm. for robotic surgery. Mm -hmm. So ladies, uh, April Snipes to my right and next to her, uh, Renee Ross. Thanks for joining us. Thank Glad you for having us. So we're, we're going to talk really what we want to do is unpack a little bit more about what you guys do, the role you play. You know, I think it's wildly unknown once the patient enters the double doors, right, and disappears from their family or from the waiting area, where do you guys step in and, and what are all the things that you do uh, in, as we say, a day in the life of? So who wants to take the lead on that uh, question? <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll start. Okay. Our, so the day normally starts for us around, it depends on when the case starts, but I'll get there before the surgery and meet the patient in pre-op. Um, do that for several reasons. One, so they can um, know my role and who I am, but I'm also assessing the patient at that time. And based on that assessment, I'm gathering and mentally starting to gather a list of supplies or extra things that we need. If they've had prior surgeries, we may need to open. Or um, if it's a critical case, we need to make sure we have some different vascular instruments in the room. So from there, um, then I'll 
start liaisoning with the circulating nurse in the room and letting her know different things that we may need and head back to the OR and that's and then when the patient rolls in um, we'll help them get moved over to the OR table and go off to sleep um, and then after that usually the surgeon is rounding at that point or doing other things so they're not in the OR yet and so we'll go ahead and get everybody positioned, the patient positioned, um, which is actually one of the more important things in the OR mm -hmm. because they're under general anesthesia. So, um, so we'll get them positioned I'll if have the, when the, just let the surgeon know when we're ready and then we'll prep and drape. And that's whenever the, the real um, role starts. So, so, you know, you, you just explained a whole list of things, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, does this take six minutes? Does it take 60 minutes? I mean, how much time is mm -hmm. going, is being put in before the first cut actually happens? Um, it, it'll vary. I think it definitely varies. If you're doing a spine case, um, it may take longer to prep. Uh, if you're doing a robotic case as well, uh, it varies anywhere from maybe 10, 15 minutes to 30 minutes to an hour. Wow. So, you know, you guys, you, you mentioned robotics. I gather that you guys uh, have done a lot of robotics cases. Care to share with the audience how many cases you guys have assisted on with DaVinci Platform? Mm. Um, I've been doing the DaVinci Platform for about 16 years now. Um, I knew you were going to ask me. Were you the first adopter? <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, well, I was one of the first ones in the Metroplex. So I've done a little over uh, 3,500. Wow. Holy wow. smoke. So 3,500 surgeries on the DaVinci uh, mm -hmm. platform. That's incredible. I, I started around 2014 on the DaVinci. So what is that? Mm, seven years. About okay. two to 300 cases a year. So what was that? 2115. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. yeah seven years at yeah. 300 is 2100. I mean, that's, that's a lot of experience. I'm curious. How does the, how do, how do the circulating nurses perceive you guys in your role? How does that Mostly they're like, when I'll walk, it's actually very nice because I'll walk in, they're like, thank God yeah. you're here. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. we're a buffer for the surgeon usually. Um, that's part of our role, I believe, is to help make sure he has everything that he needs um, mm -hmm. and to try and be a little bit of a, like I said, a buffer between the doctor and the, and the staff if we can. And you help set the tone, mm -hmm. I think. And it's, and it's also, it's so helpful to have an additional set of hands, especially trained. Yeah. We're all nurses, so we understand the role of circulators and it's, it's difficult. Um, so having help with positioning, patients are not light. Um, and knowing that, and you can cause nerve injury if you don't position pa patients properly. So it's important to have another set of trained hands in there. RNFA, first assistant. What is, what is that? What's the first assistant piece? Registered nurse first assistant. Okay, so so. Um, typically a first assistant can be either another surgeon, um, a resident surgeon, someone in training, or a registered nurse first assistant, a PA first assistant, nurse practitioner, or a licensed surgical assistant. Um, so there, and CSTs um, can be first assistants. So there's a variety of healthcare providers, but we're trained to actually provide assistance to the surgeon, which means I always tell people it's like whatever the surgeon needs to be able to see their target anatomy. So if it's retracting, suctioning, helping with um, hemostasis, you know, tying, sutures, suturing, cutting, everything. So I've heard, I've heard of stories where surgeons haven't closed a wound on their own in years. Is that mm -hmm. true? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Or they'll say, just, you just do it. And yeah. we'll go, well, they're trying to also do, go dictate and round, but usually we're the ones that close skin for the most part and yeah. they're just happy to let us do it so they yeah. can go. Definitely. Interesting. So I'm no. going to ask a bombshell question here. Are you guys in network? No. No. Why? No. I was in network uh, for several years with one insurance company and the reimbursement consistently kept decreasing. And even in, in one year, it was going to decrease a little, about 19% when I oh, did God. discuss with them um, how that I couldn't operate with those rates, they would not even come to the table and negotiate. It was so... Well, so so what I'm hearing is not a lack of want, it's a lack of will mm -hmm. on yeah. the other side of the table. And, and you know, is, is your industry, you know, physicians, you think of physicians as being in their own private practice, hanging their own shingle, kind of small group, but that's starting to change a little bit, right? We're getting larger groups. Yeah. What's a surgical assist industry look like? Is it big groups? Is it corporate or is it you know, you're hanging your own shingle. Um, we are hanging our own, for the most part, here in Texas at least. You know, we're 
when I started, I learned I had to be independent. I had to have my own business in order to do it. And so, you know, it was a lot of just learning. There's not a lot of information for you to gather. There's not a lot of us out there. So you kind of learn as you go and figure it out. I tried even to get in network. Um, for instance, with Aetna, and they told me they had a closed panel, which meant that they weren't allowing any first assistance to get in their network. Right. Um, That's troubling with this legislation, don't you think? I mean, obviously, the, I think we all sitting at this table would agree that pricing transparency and getting consent from the patient if you're non-contract would be a good thing. But, you know, what are the negative, what are the unintended consequences here uh, from, you, from your standpoint with this legislation, uh, with, this, with surgical assistance in particular? I think the spirit of the legislation is correct. I mean, I think especially we're all patients as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just providers. And so understanding that and the goal um, behind it is is good. But mm -hmm. I think that they definitely didn't understand the, the impact, the collateral damage that was going to happen um, for us. This potentially I mean, it's, it's potentially huge mm -hmm. for the independent assistant. It could put us out of business. Wow. So. Tyler, I see a very concerned look on your face I mean, well, when you hear, hear what, that. What do you think? What's interesting to me is is we've had three segments, and we've gotten to hear this from so many different angles, and the massive importance of surgical assistance. And I, I'm curious, and maybe this is uh, my own ignorance in this space, but w t talk a little bit about how you guys charge for your services and how does that compare to, let's say, a regular RN that's a circulating nurse? And because to me, this is silly. I mean, if, if – if doctors are understaffed, they don't have the people that they need to, to what, speed up the surgeries, to make sure that patients are not under anesthesia for too long and all these things are in play. Why is this such a complicated thing for the insurance companies to, to understand? And, and in, are the insurance companies putting themselves before the health and safety of their patients and are, are the patients and individuals? I don't know. So talk a little bit about that. For, um, I usually, I have a letter that I have a lot of support from my physicians. And so the patient's receiving a letter from me initially. Um, so there is some degree of notification happening in your mm -hmm. situation. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, but what about consent? Because that's a totally different animal, right? Yeah. We, uh, to some extent, there's some consents, but there's nothing um, to the level of what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. In addition, you know, for me, I, my cases book out very far in advance just because of the kind of surgery I do. So that's going to be a doable thing for me. However, for a ton of other specialties, it's mm -hmm. not going to be a doable option yeah. because so of time April, constraints. You know, that, that's interesting, right? So time constraints are one piece, whether or not the patient will actually consent because mm -hmm. they have this idea built in their head that everybody should be in network. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much work are the physicians willing to do on your behalf? Are they willing to do any of this um, that's potentially being asked of them? No, I mean, they can only do so much. So they, my physicians will notify the patients in advance to let them know that I'll contact them because uh -huh. I do um, need to send them this information to introduce myself, let them know who I am and why they're going to be getting a bill for my services. Um, but that's, they're busy. They don't have the time for that. So I actually try to take that on myself um, and what I found is the administrative burden I couldn't afford. Um, I had to hire someone to do it because if I'm in surgery, then I can't go around chasing um, the administrative piece. But because the reimbursement was so low, I couldn't afford to continue to do that. Uh, the wow. problem so, is, so you tried. Yeah, oh, you I really tried. tried. I mean, but... I was sending out consent forms and had the website and people could go online. But the problem is you, um, you know, patients are just like, why isn't the insurance company paying for this? Right. So let me get this straight. Not only do you have to be 100% on top of your game, in your specialty, working ungodly hours mm -hmm. inside of an OR, now you've got to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. You've also got to be a bill collector, yes. an accountant. Yes. CJ, Maintain this is, licensure this is requirements. It is. Yeah, it is. I mean, I think no this, this goes back. I said this in other segments, right? I asked the I asked the panels that joined us, what are the unintended consequences here? Mm -hmm. What's the what's the top one or two unintended consequences of this legislation that could just come back to bite the patient and Joe Public in the butt? Truth, I'm going to tell you a story um, I, because I see it happen. I know you've seen it too. We, I've seen them pull in um, people to come in and take care, to assist in surgery. They're not trained. They, they mm -hmm. work... Um, in the core, um, they help with transporting patients and stocking. And if they don't have help, they call them in to be retractor holders. They come in, they help with surgery, no training. 
And you're asleep as a patient. You have no idea that these people are coming in and they're participating in your care. But if we're not available and they need an extra set of hands, which they do because you can't operate and hold the tissue open at the same time. So they're calling in whomever, the is, nurses, is it more the dangerous? Is it more dangerous to have an untrained person just a, a, as a warm body or nobody at all? I mean, is, is either one, is one better than the other or are they both terrible? I honestly think probably having untrained hands in there is, the, is mm -hmm. worse. So this will happen and it's already starting to happen. Um, the other thing is, is then the, the person who's the, in the scrub role is then put in the position to handle all the equipment and, and the instrumentation of the case and then try also to assist at the same time. Multiple things are happening with that. One, they have no malpractice insurance if that if they cause an insurance an injury, so that's a liability for the facility. Oh boy. The other thing could that is, could that be a liability for the physician too? It could be a they allowed yeah, it? definitely a liability mm. for the physician. Um, but in addition to that, most of the regulatory bodies or um, associations have statements saying specifically, like American College of Surgeons, AORN, mm -hmm. specifically stating that that should not be happening. Mm -hmm. Um, but it is happening and it's going to happen more and more whenever there's not assistance around. So geographics, I'm curious, this is obviously happening here in Dallas because you guys are experiencing it. Does this just get worse? The more, you know, when, when you move to smaller towns, smaller metroplexes, smaller places where they don't have the same resources. I mean, yes. and, and I, and my second question on this is if, if I'm a patient and I'm facing a surgery an orthopedic surgery or whatever it is, what should I be looking for? I mean, this makes me just completely rethink everything as a patient, mm -hmm. not just trusting doctor says show up tomorrow morning at eight o'clock and don't eat past midnight. Right. What should the patient be looking for when they're going to be choosing a provider and, and, um, and going in to get a major surgery? I think they definitely need to be asking who's assisting. Anytime I've had um, people that are having surgery done, that's the question that I tell them to ask. And when you're, you're looking for somebody that they work with routinely, someone who knows what they want, how they want it, and who understands the procedure for mm -hmm. safety, mm -hmm. um, I think it's really important for patients to be asking those questions. So let's just, let's just assume that this legislation goes as is, mm -hmm. right? It's a very scary thought for those of us that are in the business. But what's, what's the ultimate implication if... The, if sensible regulations aren't put in place as part of the rulemaking process here uh, as we prepare to implement the legislation? Um, there's going to be a serious backlog. There's, it's going to clog up the system because if a physician is, is going to have to depend on another physician to assist them in surgery, the people are going to have to wait. Because as an example, if, if an, another physician assists in, this, in a case that may reimburse them $150 to $200, and they take six hours out of their day to do that surgery, well, they would make more money seeing patients in the office. So they it's can't economics 101. Absolutely. It doesn't make sense for you to have two physicians at the bedside doing surgery. So now if you're having to wait for another physician to assist you, then you can't schedule as many cases. And so if you as a patient are waiting to have surgery, you're going to definitely be waiting a long time. I don't, you might, CJ's probably going to kill me that I'm bringing this up, but I'm, I'm really so curious. Overall healthcare reform, everybody knows there's reform needed. This is to me a piece of that reform, but I'm curious where you guys sit in the middle of all this every day. What, what does, and quickly, I mean, I know this is a deep topic, but pure healthcare reform, whether it's single payer or it's government healthcare, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, does it work? Does it, how do, I'm just very curious from you guys' position, especially trying to play entrepreneur and nurse. Mm -hmm. It's incredible um, just what you think about that. And that is a huge question. Yeah. <laughs> um, briefly, what I think needs to happen. Um, insurance is need, needs to, whether it's an in or out network, we've got to have some sort of reasonable market value reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, it's got to be guaranteed, and I think there's got to be something to stabilize it. It's It continues to go down. One of the biggest things that I keep saying is premiums are going up, deductibles are going up, payments to providers are going down. Mm -hmm. Who's in the middle? Right. And it's the insurance company. Right. So until we target 
what's going on with insurance companies. There's not going to be any healthcare reform. Mm -hmm. Well, so with, with your final thoughts here, because we're, we're coming up on, on the end of our time, um, if you could speak to a colleague, you could speak to a legislator, you could speak to a facility administrator, what would you say to them about what they need to do to step in and make an impact? For a colleague, I would say they've got to, I mean, I'm not one who enjoys any sort of politics or getting involved, mm -hmm. but this is, and this is literally the first time I've ever stepped up. It is time for us all to step up mm -hmm. and um, make our voices known as providers. And we can't expect other people to do it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and I would say that, you know, don't forget, you're going to be a patient one day. It will come. It will touch every single one of us. And if it's not you, it's mm -hmm. your child. It's your parent. They're going to enter into a system where they can't trust whether or not the care that's being delivered to them is safe. And... I mean, do we really want that? I mean, who really matters? You got to ask that question. I mean, who look at COVID at the end of the day, who are you depending on to save your life when you end up in the hospital? Is yeah. it the insurance provider or is it the healthcare provider? Right. Well, I mean, that's, that hits home for me, right? Last mm -hmm. thing I want is to go in for a potential life-saving surgery and either I can't have it because mm -hmm. there's not adequate staff mm -hmm. or the surgery gets botched mm -hmm. because hey, it's life saving, or maybe it's just quality of life saving. I mean, right? I mean, yeah. I mean if you lose, if you can't, you know, if you can't walk, mm -hmm. if you can't enjoy playing golf, you can't do those things because of negligence. Yeah. Um, quality of life's everything. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we have an interesting uh, opportunity to engage with the community. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. it, it's going to take everybody, and I think we have to start talking to each other first. Yeah before we really start talking to legislators, because I think that's that's a big challenge. We're not going to tackle that on this particular <laughs> uh, podcast, but I think uh, intro community, healthcare community communication about what's going on and everybody being on the same page has to start happening. So thank ladies, you thank you so much thank for uh, for joining us, giving us a little in look into what you do and the battles that you're waging, because I think- And the good uh, work you're doing, man. Yeah, <laughs> unsung, unsung heroes in my mind. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So- uh, with that, we thank everybody for joining us and, and tuning in and uh, look forward to our next podcast. Not sure what the topic's going to be, but I'm sure it'll be uh, a lot of fun to talk about. Yeah. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank you.